naming and we'll do several examples. So the first thing you need to know with IUPAC naming is you need to know the, the prefixes for all the number of carbons. So that's what I have listed out here. So IUPAC prefixes, one is meth, two is F, three is probe, and so on. And once you get beyond butte, which is four, then they're more standard um, Greek-like prefixes. So it's easier to remember those, but you will just have to memorize this set of 10. Usually you won't be expected to go beyond 10. There are further prefixes for 11 and 12 and so on, but it's very unlikely that you'll need to do that. So I'll just stop at these 10. Okay, so then the rules for, for naming this in my abbreviated form is that you first need to identify the longest chain, then the lowest numbering system, then you need to name your substituents, and then you need to record everything in alphabetical order. So I will go through this. This is a very abbreviated um, set here, but I think once you understand each, each uh, rule, it's quite easy to, to apply it and it's easier to remember since they're not so uh, detailed and long in the rules. So with that, I'll just jump right into a couple examples to explain what, what the heck I'm talking about here with these prefixes and rules. So first is the longest chain. So what I mean by longest chain is the longest continuous chain of carbons that are connected continuously. So in one um, chain is what we call them here. So there's a bunch of options for this, this guy and this one. You can go one, two, three, four, five. I usually go left to right, like reading to start just because it seems natural, but you have to check all the other options. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, that's five as the longest chain. I could also start one here and go right to left. So that's one, two, three, four, five. That's also five. Those are equally acceptable for the longest chain. Or I could start up here and go one, two, three, four, five, or again, the other way and just go up at the end. So there's four possibilities to get the longest chain of five in this case, in this molecule. So with that, you move to the next rule because the longest chain is clearly five. We now have to pick which five is correct because there's only going to be one of them that makes sense. And by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, IUPAC stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. It's just a, a group that came together with to, to develop this convention so that there's no ambiguity between structural names. If everyone uses the rules that they came together with, then you'll always be able to identify the structure based on a name and vice versa. So that's the idea there. So now we're on to the longest chain that has the lowest numbering system. So what I mean by lowest numbering system is the substituent or a branch that's not part of the chain is at the lowest number in the chain. So I know that's probably hard to understand the words, but what I mean is if we consider, let's consider two of these options for five. So if we go right to left, the, so the, first of all, the chain is what I've numbered and what I'm circling here. So the only thing that's not a part of the chain is this one group, this one carbon group that's sticking out. So if we compare this to that, this branch is at two and this branch is at four. So since we want the lowest numbering system, this one is correct and this one is incorrect because the, the group is at four, here the group is at two. So two is less than four. So for the lowest numbering system, it has to be this one. Make sense? So there's a little bit of guess and check here. You do just have to look at the molecule and look for the, the longest chain and then determine which one is the lowest numbering system. In very difficult examples, you will have a choice and I will explain how you pick in that choice. But here, there is no ambiguity because it's either four or two and, and two is less than four. Okay, so next then is naming the substituents. Substituents is just a fancy term for, for branch or a, a group that is not on the, the base chain. So here our substituent is at two and it's one carbon. So since it's one carbon, we look at our prefix and we know that that means it's meth for the one carbon uh, group. Anytime a group is a substituent, so not a part of the base chain, you add a YL as the suffix. So what I've circled is a methyl group and it's at the two position in the, the chain. So this is a two methyl. 
Okay, and then next we have a five carbon base, so that is pent. And then the suffix depends on the suffix depends on the types of bonds that you have in the molecule. If they're all carbon-carbon single bonds, then it's a it's an alkane, and the suffix is ane. So this is a pentane. So with that, let me uh, do a brief aside. So there are carbon-carbon functional groups. There are alkenes, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, and these correspond to the types of bonds that are in the molecule. So in an alkane, it's carbon-carbon single bonds only. In an alkene, there's at least one carbon-carbon double bond. And in an alkyne, there's at least one carbon-carbon triple bond. So the reason that I know that this is an ane suffix is it reaches or it fits in the category of alkane. Uh, so the ane suffix is what we use. Uh, as a, another point, the alk part in all of these generic names is just a placeholder for the number of carbons that are in the specific molecule. So in this case, alk becomes pent because there's five carbons in this chain. So pent, you replace, you replace alk with pent and pentane is the five. So then you have to put everything together. So this is two methyl pentane. So you'll notice I have one more rule as alphabetical. If there are multiple substituents off of your base chain, then you have to report them in alphabetical order. So the chain is always at the end, and then the substituents would be reported in alphabetical order. And I'll, my next example will illustrate this to you know, hopefully make more sense. But anyway, this first example isn't particularly difficult, but I think it explains a lot of the base ideas with IUPAC naming. So we'll just jump into the next example. You know, feel free if you have any questions if this isn't clear, I know it's a lot of stuff and I'm trying to go quickly in recitation so we can get through as much as possible. Okay, don't hear any questions or see anything in the chat, so I'll move along. So let's do one with multiple substituents. So Yeah, this works. Okay, so using the same rules, we have to figure out the longest chain. Again, I usually go left to right to start because it's natural to me. So this is six. Now you can also go one, two, three, four, five. That's less, so it can't be that. You can also go one, two, three, four, five. That's also less, so it can't be that. But what about one, two, three, four, five, six? That's also six, so that's another option that you have to consider because those, those tie for the longest. So longest chain wise, these are both sufficient. Then now you have to consider the lowest numbering system. So which substituent is at the, the lowest number in, the, in the, the chain. And here the first substituent is at three. Here the first substituent is at three. It's like, okay, so now you have to pick. So, and there's rules for this as well. So if you have a choice in the chain, it's always, the, it's always alphabetical order, which is why I have this as rule number four. So what I mean by that is let's name this chain or this branch. This branch is an ethyl group and it's at three, but that's not critical here, but it is at three just for completeness. And this is a methyl group at four. So, Alphabetical determines priority. So ethyl E is before M in the alphabet. So this ethyl group gets priority here in a choice like this. So the only correct numbering system is putting the lowest number at the ethyl group instead of the methyl group. So this is incorrect and the, the top one is correct. I'm sorry if this was already asked. Are these sessions being recorded? Yes, they'll be. They are being recorded and they'll be posted um, on my YouTube channel at Chem, Chem Tutor Derek. We can't figure out exactly where to put them anywhere else, so I'm going to put them there for now until we can get a, a better a better space. So hopefully that works. Um, yeah. So questions about this priority here of why the top one is correct and not the bottom one. I'll finish naming it, but th this is very confusing. This took 
a while for me to learn when I was first learning this. There's so many nuances in this stuff. We good? Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so this is right. So now I'll erase this bottom one because it's incorrect. So now we have to put all of this together. So the, the base chain is hex because there's six. It's an alkane again because it's carbon-carbon bonds. So A and E, carbon-carbon single bonds specifically. What is the third rule of substituents? This is uh, just naming the substituents. So what I mean by that is anytime it's a branch, the suffix is a YL. So like here, this is a methyl because it's a YL because it's a branch. And ethyl, is, it's again, it's a YL because it's a branch. It's eth because there's two carbons in the branch. It's meth because there's one carbon in the branch. So hopefully that answers your question. I was thinking those were rules for parent chain assignment. No, no, yeah, gotcha. Okay, so yeah, here's the parent chain. As Harrison pointed out, is hexane. That's the uh, a term that's commonly used, or the the root name, whatever. It, it's it's just the chain name. So that's six here. So hexane, and then there's an ethyl and methyl group. So now here you have to pick again which one goes first. So in this case, it's always alphabetical again. So if if you're ever unsure of how you pick, it's always alphabetical. So that will be the easiest way for you to remember. So here. The question is, do we put ethyl first or methyl first in our name? And it's like I'm saying, it's alphabetical. So we have to put E before M. So it's three ethyl, four methyl hexane. It's not numerical, even though it happens to be in this case that it's, it's three and then four. That's not necessarily the case. For example, if, if, four, if it was four ethyl, three methyl, the ethyl would still go first. Like I'll give you a different example of that because this one, it doesn't apply. But my point is, don't worry about the numbers. It's only the the uh, first letter of the, the actual substituent name. So, oh, and by the way, I don't think uh, this will be particularly picky in the, in the exams or quizzes or whatever, but the technical right way to use IUPAC is always put hyphens between numbers and letters. So three hyphen letter and then letter hyphen number hyphen number, et cetera. So that's the way we do it. This, the last part is always one word. So this is a substituent hexane. This is one word. Um, also you put commas between numbers if they're adjacent to each other. So the next example will show how they can be adjacent to each other, how um, numbers can be adjacent to each other. So, so yeah, questions? Let's see how long did this take? 16 minutes okay not great all right let's do one more of this type i'm going to add a double bond just to spice this up a little bit uh let's see i want i want to have a two okay so i need something like this yeah, okay, this will this will work for what I want. So again, longest chain. So I usually go left to right, like I've been saying. So one, two, three, four, but now I can quickly see that I have to go up and not to the right, because if I go right or down, it would be five. If I go up, it's five and then six. So that is better. Uh, you could also go this way. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and um, yeah, anything else would be five or less. So it has to be one of these two options. So now we move right into the lowest numbering system. And this is again, another nuance of IEPAC stuff. So you would, from what I've introduced so far, you would correctly say that you think this is the right one because it has the substituent at three as opposed to four, right? That would be, you, you were following along, that would be completely correct. However, functional groups have priority always. So in this case, our double, double, our carbon double bond is the functional group. So that means what I say it has priority is if it can be at a lower number than the other chain, then it has to be, and that has to be the right one. So this is the correct one, not this one, because 
the carbon-carbon double bond is at one instead of five. We don't care about the substituent. We only care about the substituent if there's no functional group, which is like just a basic alkane, like my other examples were, where we then had to consider the, the um, substituent's position for the lowest numbering system. So hopefully that makes sense. You'll, uh, I have a video on the, on the channel that explains functional groups and how to identify them. So hopefully that, uh, watch that if you're unsure what I'm talking about with, with just the idea of functional groups, but those always have priority in terms of naming. So you need to put them at the lowest number that they can be in the chain. All right, so that explains that. Now, what do we have here? We have a six-membered alkene now because we have a carbon-carbon double bond. So this is an alkene. It's six-membered, so it's a hexene. Oops. It's a hexene, and it's at the one position. So this is a one hexene. Uh, also, so this is incorrect. I can erase this. So also, we have these two single carbons branches. So those are methyl groups, and they're, they're four methyl groups. They're on the fourth position, I should say. And there's two of them. So anytime there are identical substituents, you need to include a prefix for the carbon prefix. So I said that extremely slow because it doesn't make any sense. But if you have more than one identical group, you need to have an additional prefix. So what I mean is, in this case, to describe these two, you have to have 4,4 four, and then dimethyl. The di is a prefix to the carbon prefix. And the reason that this di is necessary is to explain that there is a identical group at two positions. It's not, if you just said 4,4 four, four methyl, the ambiguity with that is, is this methyl bound twice as so you would think it's like a double bond there and that that's why it's that's why they uh, have this as the convention to make it very clear it's a little bit redundant but it avoids this issue that it's bound doubly it's just it's definitely two groups that are the same and they ha happen to be on the same carbon in this case so again hopefully that made sense but if you put all this together it is four four dimethyl and then it's hexene, one hexene. Ran out of space a little bit, but hexene. I'll rewrite it just for clarity. You can also sandwich the one between hex and ene, which on my answer keys, you will see that as well. Okay, yeah, you can still see that. Both of these are acceptable as far as I'm concerned and anybody, like if you put that on your exam, that would be fine as well. Sometimes there are cases in which you have, you have to put it here because you need like an additional uh, number describing something else. Like if you had multiple functional groups, but you probably won't have to name that stuff in this class. Maybe next semester you'll have to do stuff like that. But, okay, questions, is this clear? Does the prefix contribute to the alphabet order? That is a fantastic question that I should have thought of. The answer is no. Um, you, if you had that, in this case, it doesn't matter, but if you had an ethyl group, the ethyl group would still come first, not the di. And if you had three, it would be tri, and that T wouldn't matter. If you had four, it would be tetra, that T also doesn't matter. So yeah, that's a good question. Okay, anything else? We'll do another example. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's do one with the, the idea that was just pointed out, which is correct. So let's say, I'm gonna make it cyclic just to, I'm trying to increase the diff difficulty as we go along here. But let's say we have this. So anytime you see cyclic, just know cyclo. All the other stuff is the same. So if it's 
if it's cyclic and it has just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, single bonds, no, no double bonds, it's a cycloalkane. If it has the double bonds, then it's a cycloalkene, triple bond, cycloalkyne, which this is basically never going to happen in this case, but just as, um, you know, being complete, it's, it's the same idea. So this then, it's all carbon, carbon, single bonds. So this is a cycloalkane right away, like generically speaking. So this can be confusing for de determining the longest chain. So let me break it down for you. Anytime you have a cyclic structure, the cycle counts as one chain and everything bound to it counts as another chain. So here, however you want to number this, I'll explain how you correctly number it, but here I'm just numbering it for our longest chain purposes. This one is five and that that's it. It can't, you can't go one, two, three, four, five, six, or anything like that. The cycle is one chain and everything else attached to it is a, another chain. So this, you would have this five member chain, this two member chain, and then these, uh, oops, these one member chain each is each. So obviously then five is longer than two and, and one and one. So the five membered ring is going to be the base chain here. So, Again, hopefully that is clear why there's the distinction there. So now the question is we can pick where one starts in this, like where we start our numbering system in the chain, in the cycle. We can put it wherever we want. So again, if you're ever unsure of what goes where, what's the order, it's always alphabetical. Uh, so then is the ring always going to be the parent, even if one of the side chains is longer? That's a good question as well. If the side chain is longer, then the side chain will be the, uh, the base. And then this, the ring will be a uh, substituent. We'll do the next example. We'll show how you would uh, approach that. Yeah, but good question. So again, alphabetical. So this is an ethyl group. And then these are our methyl groups. So this is a a dimethyl, these two. And I'm ignoring the numbers here for right now, but alphabetically, E comes before M. We don't consider di, just like um, the, the previous question was. So with that, then the numbering system has to be one, two, three, four, five. It has to go uh, counterclockwise because if you went clockwise, the first substituent would be at one and then the last substituent would be at five. So again, lowest numbering system now, we've exhausted all the other options. So it has to be one and then clockwise from the ethyl group. So putting this all together then, our base chain is cyclopentane. Our alk becomes pent because there's five in the chain. And then it's one ethyl uh, has to come first because alphabetical order. And then it's a two, two di methyl. Well, completely out of room there, but you get the idea. And this illustrates another point that I made that between numbers is a comma, just for correctness, completeness. Okay. I will answer Siljay's question with the next question, with the next uh, example, and feel free to ask other questions about this one, if you have them. I'll leave this up for a second in case anybody's taking notes. I don't want to erase it, but I guess you have the recording, so actually I'm going to erase it. <laughs> Okay, so let's move to the next example. Um, what was the question? Oh, the longer chain. Yeah, yeah. So let's consider like yeah. Let's do this. Okay. So this probably looks scary, but we can break it down. So always the the cyclic part is one chain. So the cyclic guy here is three membered. So that's one chain. Then if we look at all the other possibilities, we have one, two, three, four, five, or 
one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. So clearly the five membered linear chain or the acyclic chain is the longest. So that would be our parent chain. So I'll erase the numbered on our cycle because it's now just a substituent. So um, this is an alkane because it's carbon carbon single bonds only. It's a pentane because there's five. We have three substituents total. These two are methyl groups. So we have a two, three dimethyl. And this is the hardest part. We have a three membered, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this. If you go one, two, three, four, five the other way, then our substituents are at higher numbers. So that's why this is a correct uh, system, it has to go left to right. So, but lastly, we have a three membered cycle. So this is actually a one cyclopropyl cycle because it's cyclic, prop because there's three, and YL because it's a substituent. So, and again, you don't consider the prefix to the prefix. So you're just comparing uh, prop to, or P to M um, in the alphabetical order consideration. Okay, so putting this all together, um, M comes before P. So uh, putting this in order, it would be methyls, the methyls first. And then the one cyclopropyl, and then imagine this is one word, but I'm out of space, one cyclopropyl pentane. Okay, I, I bet you wouldn't have to do that, uh, wouldn't have to name this as a substituent, but this is how you, you do it um, in case it comes up. So any questions about naming? Now I want to move into structural isomers, which will continue with the idea of naming, but it applies it in a little bit different way, which is why I started with IEPEC here first, and then we'll jump to the isomers. Okay, so I don't see any questions. So I'm gonna erase most of this stuff now. So we'll just have to remember our rules. Uh, hopefully you have them written down if you want them, but you can always check the recording if you don't have them. So first of all, we wanna talk about isomers. So for two molecules to be an isomer, they require a uh, question. Will you be putting a video on S and R configuration on your YouTube? Yes, I will. It'll be posted probably tomorrow, I would say. Um, if I have time, I'll get it up today, but it, it takes a while to export and edit the video. So, but um, yes, it'll definitely be up this weekend sometime. In addition to the acid base stuff for uh, the mastery assignment that's due sometime next week. All right, so for isomers to exist, there has to be, they have to have the same molecular formula for two molecules. That's the base requirement. If it's going to be a structural isomer or any, any kind of isomer has to have the same molecular formula. If it's a structural isomer, then the structure is different, which it seems kind of obvious, right? But it's, first of all, it's structural or conformational. Those are the same thing. They're just different names for the same thing, just to, be confusing, but they're structural isomers. So the name is different, which suggests that the structure is different. This is why I went through IUPAC naming first, because if you quickly name structures, you can tell that they're conformational or structural isomers, depending on um, what you have here. Sorry, conformational is incorrect. They're constitutional isomers. I just realized conformational is a different thing that we'll talk about later. But regardless, you'll see them as structural isomers in all of my questions, but those are the same. So the name is different. So let's look at an example. Let's look at a few, I guess, here. 
right? Does this all work in two, three, four, five, six? Yeah, okay. So let's look at these three. And the question is just determine if the if they're structural isomers or are they identical or are they different? Or they're neither, none of the above. So first you have to determine if the molecular formula is the same. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six carbons here. And then it's completely saturated, it's all single bonds. So that means that this is 14. We can check by counting. So three, 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 two, two, one. So that's nine plus four is 13 plus one is 14. Here, this is again, completely saturated, no double bonds or anything. So it's C6H14. This we can check again by counting three, three, two, two, two. So that's six and six and one more two. Six and six is 12 plus two is 14. Here, this has a ring, so it has one degree of unsaturation. So this is going to be C6H12, because all of these have two hydrogens, times six is, is 12. So right away, you can say that this cyclic structure is not an isomer of these guys. They're not isomeric, structural or otherwise. They just don't have the same formula, so you can throw it out. Now, the question is, are these guys are isomers because they have the same formula. Now it's what type of isomer are they? And this, I think the easiest way to do it is name it. So if we name this real quick, we know that this is 2-methyl pentane. And I understand you probably won't be able to do this instantly like I did, but you'll get practice with it and it won't be so bad. But just going through the rules again, it's longest chain. So one, two, three, four, five. It has to be right to left in this case because there's no functional groups. So we need the branch to be at the lowest position in the chain. So that's two. And then this is a methyl group because there's one carbon. It's a substituent. So YL. So that explains the name. This has no substituents. It's just a six membered chain. So this is hexane. So if you compare the names, they're different. So these are structural isomers. You can also look at their, their generic structure and be like, what's the longest chain in both of these cases? Don't, you don't have to go necessarily through the whole naming process, but you know that this has a six member chain, this has five, so that is already different. So they're structural isomers by, by that. So questions, is that clear? So let's do a different type of structural isomer question. So let's say you had to draw all of the different isomers of some formula, structural isomers of like, I don't know, let's make it relatively easy, C4, H10. Okay. So anytime I look at the problem like this, the easiest thing to do is first draw all the carbons in a single chain. So that's four, that, that works. This is, if you're unsure of how it has H10, this is three plus two is five plus two is seven plus three is, is 10. So hopefully it's clear how you do that because we talked about it in last week's recitation, but in these skeletal structures, hydrogens always fill the octet for the carbon. So this carbon only has one bond, so three, and then so on. So the next thing now is to break, uh, a so-called break the four member ring and move one of the groups onto a different position. So if we make, instead of a four longest chain, we have three, we can add a methyl group there. This is clearly different. This would be a butane and this would be a two methyl propane but again, I don't think you need to name the entire thing, but you just see that the longest chain is three, no matter how you cut it. It'd be one, two, three if you go up, one, two, three if you go right or backwards or any combination, it's always three. So there's that. Now, is there any other way to arrange this molecule? Uh, let's see, if you put the methyl group like here, for example, so let's say you move this one here. Well, now that's clearly the same. Uh, if you put this one here, then it'd be this, which is clearly the same as this. It's just upside down or reversed. Um, so is there any other way to do this? Not that I see. So there, these must be the two isomers of this formula. So again, there's a little bit of guess and check here. 
but this is kind of the process that you go about with these structural isomers. So j just uh, to be clear, if you look at these two, they're not structural isomers, they're just rotated. So these are either rotational isomers, or depending on the question, you could even call these identical because rotational isomers are identical molecules. They're just rotated and you're just looking at it at a different perspective. So it's not gonna, it's not like they have different chemical properties or anything like that. Whereas structural isomers do have different chemical properties because they're just inherently different things. So they can do different types of reactions and stuff as we'll see in, as we go along in the, in the course. So, questions. I'll do one more that's like this that's a little bit harder that has more than just two options. I just threw one out that happened to be easy but okay so let's do one more like that and I'm it's clear I'm not going to get to chair confirmations or Newman projections so depending on how my weekend goes you may see that on the YouTube channel. So let's see isomers here. Again, draw isomers. This one now has two less hydrogens, which automatically means that it has to have a one degree of unsaturation. This is an idea that I haven't talked about yet in recitation, and it might not have been talked about in lecture either, but an un a degree of unsaturation is a ring or a double bond, or a, I'll just call them pi bonds, because you could have a triple bond that would have a pot two pi bond characters so that would be two degrees of unsaturation like for example for example we had this molecule this would have two degrees of unsaturation and therefore its structure its formula would be c4h6 which we can check because three two plus one oops sorry about that my phone is at 20 percent but regardless, uh, so this is C4H6 because we have three, two, and then one is six. So there we go. So anyway, we'll get into degree of unsaturation more in a different video. But here, this just explains the idea for what you need to do this problem. So that means that there has to be a ring or a double bond in this molecule. So I like to start with the rings. It doesn't matter what you do, really. But here's one ring. Then you could make the ring smaller and add a methyl group. Um, those are the only options with rings, as far as I can tell, because you can't make a two-membered ring, obviously, what shape would that be? Um, and that's it. Th those are the only options since you only have four carbons. So again, check that this is eight. So two, four, six, eight. This has uh, two, four, five, and eight. So that it all is the same formula. Then you can have a pi bond. So you can have the pi bond here, for example. You could have a pi bond here or here. These are different isomers for a different reason. This will be explained again in a different video. So at this point, you wouldn't need to know this, but this, this is trans, this is cis. So maybe that is familiar from lecture, but I'll explain that in, in more detail at a different time. And then if you put the, let's see, if you put the methyl groups there, you could do that. That's a different, um, uh, molecule, different structural isomer. Is there any other possibility? Not that I see, because I'm going off of this guy. So if I put this methyl group here instead, you would get that. If I put the methyl group here, you would get this, and then you would get the, the other isomer where they're both on the same side. But that, as far as I can tell, is the six isomers for this formula. So again, hopefully that makes sense. For since we have eight minutes, I will I'll do a couple questions from the worksheet, um, and I'll be sending out the uh, answer key later today or, or early tomorrow, just depending on when I get a chance. So we've at so far for our IUPAC naming, we've always I've been giving you the structure and not the name. So let's for the remainder of class, let's go the other way. So let's say, let's do D star. So this is D star in the worksheet, if, you, if you're looking at that. So it's three, three, six, six. This is probably 
beyond what you need to know how to do. But I think that's that makes it a good example because if you do it, then you're you're golden. But I just want to illustrate that it's it's always the same rules. So it doesn't matter how complicated the name gets or the structure gets, you you can follow the exact same rules. So the first thing to point out that is definitely different from what we've seen in all the other examples is there's a prefix to this suffix here. So what that means is that there's two enes. So there's two carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds, uh, rather. So, and they're located at one and four in the, oops, did I miss something? It's cyclo, oh no, it's here, okay. So there's two carbon-carbon bonds in the cyclic uh, structure. Oh, I did miss something, hexa, I was like, something's not right. Okay, it's a six-membered cyclic structure and there's two double bonds in the cyclic structure. So anytime I see a name like this, you always start with the root. So the root is a cyclohexane, ignore all the other junk initially. So it's a cyclohexane, that's our root. Then we have two enes, we have two double bonds and they're located at one and four. So let's just call this one, you just have to generically number it however you want. And what I mean by that is like you could do, you could do this, you know, or this. You, you'll see that you can number this, all of these such that it's one and four. So you, you pick. I think this makes the most sense just because it's like uh, vertical, but it doesn't matter. So anyway, erasing these, these are the, this is the cyclo, one four hexadiene diene because there's two of these one four so they're at the one and four position in the ring and now the rest of it is a tetramethyl so there's four methyl groups two of them at their same position so there's two positions with two methyl groups for four methyl groups so here i can leave the numbers i guess so at six there's two methyls and at three there's also two methyls. So I'm going to redraw it without the junk numbered systems, but that this is 3366-tetramethylcyclo-1,4-hexadiene. So say that six times fast. Chemists do have a ability to, <laughs> to make a rather simple structure into an extremely long name, but you won't have to verbally say them usually, so you'll be okay. Okay, any questions? All right, we have time for one more, or we can do a few questions if you have them. Is there any particular thing that you would like to do? Otherwise, I'll just do another IPAC name to structure question. We didn't cover it, but I wanted to do the cis cyclohexene chair. Uh, yeah, sure, we can do that. I will make a video about chairs. Um, I mean, now I got like four video topics, but I was hoping to do a video about Newman and chair this weekend, but now I'll definitely be doing RNS and S. So anyway, we'll, we'll do that probably here and I'll see if I can get the time to do the additional stuff. So you're saying cis, so I would imagine you mean like um, this, right? or yeah okay or is equivalent to this those are the same thing so yeah i'm assuming you've seen in class these are drawn like chair conformations like this and by the way it's easiest to draw this if you start just draw like a butane like that and then you draw parallel lines uh to to the line that's across so like so parallel here, parallel here, parallel here. So this is parallel to this, this is parallel to this, this is parallel to that. And it, it's the only way that you can draw it in this sense that makes any sense. So, um, great, so that's how you draw the chair. Now, when you're comparing it to these structures, you have either axial positions or equatorial. Axial is vertical equatorial is these like non-vertical I guess they're uh, 
I don't know, like 120 degree angle maybe to the, the vertical line. So anytime you're drawing this, you need to consider the direction. So these are both on the same side. So if I were to draw this, for example, for the methyl groups, this methyl group is up, this methyl group is down. And when I say it's relative to this, sorry, okay, relative to that like line, the, where the carbon is, this is above that, this is below that. So this would be the correct structure for trans. Like so, it doesn't work for cis. So, okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So now it's comparing it to the cis, we have to do it so that it matches the cis. So, we can do this, for example. Now relative to this position, the methyl group is up. Relative to this position, the methyl group is up. So this would be one representation of this guy in the chair confirmation. So that would work. Or you could do this, where now relative to this position, it's down. Wow, that arrow was not good. Down, and then relative to this position, it's down. So those are both cis because they're both pointing in the same direction. One case it's up, one case it's down. So a common misconception for students is they want to think that these, the wedges or dashes correspond to axial equatorial and it has nothing to do with that. The only thing that this tells you is the direction that they're oriented. It doesn't necessarily even mean that wedges are up in this case, like it doesn't mean that. It just means that the relative position has to be the same. So since these are both on the same side, just like here, they have to be on the same side in this, this final chair representation. So both of these are acceptable. Now, this is something I haven't talked about and my video will do a better job than I'm rushing here in the few minutes that we have left, but the most stable chair will have the largest groups in the equatorial position. So, this will be most stable, so I'll just, I'll just call stable. So if we compare the two options for this, they both have one methyl group in the equatorial position and one in the axial, so these are equally stable. But if we considered trans, and I know we're out of time, but I will do this real quick. So if we consider trans, the two options are this or or that. So this has the methyl groups in the equatorial position. These have both of them in the axial position. So this would clearly be the most stable confirmation by quite a bit. So hopefully that answers your question. I know I had to rush it a bit. Great. So I'll stick around for a minute if you have any other questions. Um, but otherwise, I'll see you next week. And definitely check out my channel. I'll, have, I'll be posting as much as I can. And, and yeah, hopefully that will be helpful for you guys. Yeah, you too. Have a good weekend, everyone.